Hi, good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining this presentation. We're very excited about to talk about um, this topic that affects many women and Dr. Colligan is going to be leading the presentation. I'm going to be answering a lot of the questions that come in. So you guys can use the Q&A or the chat. I don't know uh, the difference. I believe the Q&A, it's a private one and the chat is public. Is that right? Yes. Sure. I, I think I think you're absolutely right. Yes. Yeah. And then just to confirm, because um, one of the attendants said that they're only able to see the speaker. So I want to make sure that everybody's um, seeing the presentation. So if you think we're good to go, then we'll start. All right. Um, should we should we start? I'm actually seeing the uh, the screen perfectly fine, so I'm not okay. sure. Yeah. Great. All right. Well, welcome everybody. Thanks for, for being here. I'm, I'm very excited to, to be here with my partner, Dr. Saiz, and we'll both be doing this discussion. I'll just be sort of, um, uh, I guess, leading on some of the topics, but um, we're both going to be presenting our thoughts. And um, this is um, uh, the shop from our, our, our of our building. Um, we're across from the Duck Pond in Ridgewood, New Jersey at 1200 East Ridgewood Avenue. That's myself and Dr. Saiz. And the first thing I like to bring up is just what is urogynecology because a lot of people still haven't heard of this field. And we're kind of a, a mix of, of some of the aspects of urology and some of the aspects of gynecology. So we provide comprehensive evaluation of, and, and treatment of, of, for female pelvic floor disorders such as pelvic organ prolapse and urinary incontinence and overactive bladder to name a few. Um, these, these are very common problems. There's an epidemic actually of prolapse and incontinence um, in, the, in the United States and around the world. Uh, the, the current lifetime risk if you, uh, for women that live to be 80 years old, there's about a 30% chance that they're gonna have surgery to correct one or both of these problems. And that number is expected to increase by 50% in the next um, several decades. And for those of you who are not familiar with the terminology, uh, many people refer to prolapse as a dropped bladder or something protruding like a herniation. You may have heard maybe someone in your family saying, oh, my womb came down or my bladder dropped. So that's what prolapse means. And incontinence is the leakage of urine, which is the main topic of the presentation today. Yes. So um, we, we, I referred to these as, as dysfunctions of the pelvic floor. And um, so that might bring up the question, what is the pelvic floor? Well, in one image here, you see the female pelvic organs. Christina, can you see my laser pointer? Yes, I can, yes. So here's the uterus, there's the bladder. This is the vagina, which is usually a potential space. And there's the rectum. And when we fill in the gaps with the muscles, that's the pelvic floor muscles. So they provide sort of a floor for all of the organs of the female pelvis. Imagine this as a little hammock that is holding everything in place. Exactly. Without that hammock, without the musculature, the pelvic organs um, are supported just by their connective tissue. So this image shows what things would be like if you didn't have any muscles at all, which is, you can see, le a, less, a less functional system. Here is just the, just the pelvic floor muscles and no, none of the organs. So you can see how they occupy the space. So if you think of the the pelvis of a, of a skeleton that you're familiar with, um, the, the thing that fills that gap in the pelvis is the pelvic floor musculature. So when you're doing something called Kegel exercises that most people have heard of, you're actually squeezing those pelvic floor muscles. And in this little cartoon, if you watch both images as, they, as the muscles flex, you'll see in a standing position, it would feel like the, that you're bringing the muscles or the organs forward. And if you're laying down, it'll feel like you're elevating those muscles. And these are exercises that everybody's uh, probably tried, but the main thing to realize about them is that you could be doing it in front of anybody and, it, and, and no one would ever know that you were doing it because it should only be movements inside the pelvis. In other words, you wouldn't be flexing your buttocks muscles or any other muscles or using your abdomen, you'd just be flexing inside um, around the pelvic organs. And, um, and that's a proper Kegel exercise squeeze. Um, oftentimes we'll see patients in the office and ask them to do what they are believing is a Kegel squeeze and they may be doing it incorrectly. So we do some coaching on that and we can send patients to physical therapy for even more enhanced coaching about that. 
uh, like a, a good way to know just for practice, not to do it constantly, but a good way to know if you're actually performing that muscle contraction correctly is if you try to stop the flow of urine midstream. If you're able to do that, that was actually a good Kegel contraction, but we don't want you to constantly be interrupting your urine flow. You can do it just as a practice exercise, but not all the time. Then you should learn how to do it without that. Exactly. So let's get into the types of urinary incontinence. There's several types. The first and the most common and the one we're mainly talking about today is stress incontinence. That's the type of leakage that occurs with spurts of urine that in response to some sort of physical stress like coughing, laughing, sneezing, those sorts of things. And especially with exercise or people might um, have it with the, when they're you know, jumping, do jumping jacks or jumping on a trampoline, spurts of urine with those kinds of activities is what we call stress incontinence. And urge, urge incontinence or overactive bladder is when you feel as though you have a, a very strong urge to go to the bathroom. You, you can't maybe get there in time. It, it uh, becomes sort of overwhelming and abrupt when you're, when you're on the way to the bathroom or, or maybe even going too frequently or going at night. Um, not always with leaking. Sometimes you can have this problem, but you actually hold it every time, but it's still an issue. And, um, and so that's called overactive bladder. And then there's another type, which is a mi mixed incontinence, which would be a combination of the two. That's actually very common to have both, both kinds. And then um, there can be other types that are more rare, such as incontinence that would occur with something called a fistula, which is when there would be an abnormal communication between the bladder or the urethra and the, and the vaginal wall. Those are much, much less common in, in the US. So it's, uh, it's important to take into consideration that a lot of times we hear these symptoms and we think, oh, that was like when my grandma used to suffer or you know, after having kids. What, we don't want to normalize this. We don't want people to think this is aging and it's just part of what you have to endure as a woman as you get older and you go through menopause because that's not correct. It's a very common situation where women would have leakage of urine, but that doesn't make it normal. It's like saying that high blood pressure is okay because everybody has it, right? Exactly. So I, I have many examples and they're unfortunately sad examples of um, women would only come to see us once the problem has gotten so bad that they've been doing all these coping strategies to try to you know, bypass this problem. For example, I'm sure many of you can relate of wearing dark clothes or black pants if you're going to a show or the theater because you know, like, you know, when that break comes, it's time to use the restroom, there's going to be a line and maybe you're not going to make it in time. So you wear black pants and you tie a sweater around your waist. Or maybe if you're going to the gym or there's a wedding or you want to dance, you're constantly going to the bathroom trying to empty your bladder. I had a, a patient that told me that Every time she would go to the store and she would have to buy the incontinence pads, she would feel embarrassed because it would be very obvious to everyone that she had the issue. So whenever she had to do that, she would buy like a bunch of uh, incontinence pads all at once with a little um, card. And she would tell the cashier, oh, my friend is turning 50 and we're just playing a prank on her and that's why I'm getting all these pads. So it's amazing the amount of um, coping strategies and things that we do before we actually uh, voice this concern to the doctor. And I can guarantee that if you open the conversation up with your friends and your you know, colleagues, they all are going to say, oh, that happens to me too. Or, oh, I didn't know that everybody has this. So it's important to have that conversation with your friends. It's true, and um, remember the one of the slides I showed about how common the problem is. It really, basically, every other one of your female friends has this issue or, or an issue similar. So, what are the treatments? Well, um, first of all, let's talk about the Kegel muscles because there's two ways to use the Kegel muscles um, and and um, to benefit you. So, if once you get the strength and the control to to let you flex those Kegel muscles, one way that you can you can try this the very next time you have to go to the bathroom. When you get a strong urge to urinate, maybe an unwanted strong urge to urinate, if you're very still and you do sort of flicking contractions of those muscles, in other words, not squeeze and hold, but on, off, on, off, on, off several times, that can send a signal to your bladder to relax, especially if you distract yourself. Now, if you are doing this, but you're heading towards the bathroom, then all bets are off. It's just going to start coming because something about heading to the bathroom really overwhelms the system and makes the urine just come. But if you can make yourself sit there 
and do these contractions and maybe distract yourself with your phone or talk to a colleague or something like that, then the, you can wait until the urge subsides and then take yourself to the bathroom under more control. So that's the way to use Kegel exercises in a, in a way to control overactive bladder. The way to use the same muscles, by the way, to help with stress incontinence is more of a knack where you learn to squeeze those muscles right before you're gonna do something like sneeze or, or cough, which you might be doing already. But um, it's impossible really to use the Kegel muscles uh, to help during exercise, because how could you possibly concentrate on your Kegel muscles and, and at, at the same time that you're trying to do some sort of exercise, it just doesn't work out. So that's why we'll talk about the other treatments for stress incontinence. So with, when you see this graph and what uh, Dr. Gullian was explaining, it's for those patients who have that urgency type of leakage, right? I always say it's like the key in the door syndrome. The moment you pull into your driveway, you put the keys in the door, the first thing you guys do is drop your shopping bags and run to the restroom, right? So if you start modifying or retraining the way the brain is controlling the bladder, believe it or not, you can achieve a little bit more time before you actually have to void or to prevent that accident. Yes. Now, um, other treatments for overactive bladder include fluid management. You don't want to be um, putting uh, foods or drinks in your body that are going to make the problem worse. The, the, the number one or number two and number three things would be coffee, tea, and chocolate. Um, so making those dietary changes and, and not over drinking. Some people um, believe that they need to drink you know, uh, crazy amounts of water to stay healthy. It's really not true. Um, uh, I think there's um, a lot of information out there that's not necessarily correct about um, how much water is necessary. Um, so some people could just do themselves a favor by just drinking uh, more, I guess, normal or moderate amounts of fluid, and then certainly avoiding things like coffee, tea, and chocolate. Then when we um, get beyond that, there's medications that are available. Some of them are, are better than others. The, the old fashioned medications called anticholinergics uh, tend to produce very unwanted side effects like constipation, dry mouth, and even sometimes memory loss. So we, we don't prescribe those very often. Uh, but there's something called Mirvetrig, which is a um, different class of drug that um, is, is without very many side effects at all. And so we, we do find ourselves prescribing that drug when the um, uh, non-pharmacologic um, treatments that I've suggested don't work. And then up the line, there's other things for overactive bladder, such as Botox injections, or even something called neuromodulation, but we're getting off topic talking about these in too much detail. Anything to add, Christina? Yeah, I would say that it's, uh, you know, for these patients who have that urgency, I gotta go now, and they go frequently, eliminating, like you said, coffee, even if it's decaf, because it's very acidic, uh, carbonation. A lot of times we're drinking mm. seltzer water, yeah. sparkling water all day, and any carbonation is not great. Tea, especially the actual tea, but if you're doing a herbal infusion, then maybe, okay, and you know, there's there's multiple resources. If anyone is interested, I can um, paste a link for a uh, free uh, PDF book online that talks a lot about overactive bladder and what lifestyle changes can improve this condition without needing medication. Exactly. And so then, let's go on to the main right. topic today, which is the treatment of stress urinary incontinence. So stress incontinence is the leakage of urine that ha happens with a with a an activity like a cough or a laugh or a sneeze. And it causes the urethra which to move. So again, just by way of ex explanation again, here's the bladder filled with urine. We're looking in from the side, that's the urethra. There's the vagina leading up to the uterus and that's the rectum. So um, when you cough or laugh or sneeze, there's extra movement around the urethra that allows the urine to just spurt out. So that now the, the, the most successful treatment for this and the most tried and true type of treatment for this is something called a suburethral sling. So this is the sling here. It sits under the urethra. It's placed there in the operating room. It's about a 20 minute procedure. It can be under local anesthesia. Um, it, so it's a relatively minor surgery, placing this um, small piece of mesh under the urethra and it sits there loosely. And then when you cough or strain, it, the urethra sort of bounces instantaneously against the sling to prevent the leakage. This is a very, very successful treatment. Um, and and it, it is made of mesh. And so when we say the word mesh, a lot of people get 
um, uh, understandably upset because there's been a lot of negative uh, imagery and, and uh, negative information out there about mesh. Um, but it's, it's important to note that this particular procedure has been around basically unchanged for over 20 years now and has been proven safe and effective. This surgery came along when I was um, just finishing my fellowship training and um, it radically changed the, the world um, of the treatment of incontinence in women, changing it from something that was a very long kind of um, uh, invasive operation to something that's truly minimally invasive. And, and it became extremely uh, popular worldwide because of that. Now, the reason that, that I think that mesh can get sort of a bad name is because of something called vaginal mesh. It's important to know that a sling that we're talking about for treatment of urinary incontinence is not vaginal mesh. Vaginal mesh is the same basic material, but cut to a different size using a different connection point and treating a different problem. So prolapse of the uterus looks like this, and surgery to correct prolapse of the uterus is done with, was uh, done with mesh transvaginally. Um, and it's, a, as you can see, it's a much bigger procedure the, the issue here is that um, the, they're not the same. The companies that um, produce the slings for the urinary incontinence, later they um, sought to build on that success of the stress urinary incontinence treatments by creating these products called vaginal mesh for prolapse. And um, the FDA noted some problems with the vaginal mesh for prolapse products and they put out warnings to the general public. And those warnings prompted lawsuits. And so you, the rest is history. There's been tremendous lawsuits around vaginal mesh. The issue is getting mixed up with um, slings being part of that. Slings are inappropriately included in some of those, those lawsuits, but um, it's not the same. In fact, the FDA and all relevant medical societies support the use of mesh suburethral slings as the most safe and effective treatment for stress urinary incontinence. Yeah, this uh, is very important to understand that we've been doing this procedure since the 90s and is, it is the standard of care. And I have a little sample here of what exactly is a mesh? Because when we say mesh, people think there's wires, there's metal, it's just basically suture material. I don't know if you can see it there that has been knitted together and is a permanent suture that doesn't disintegrate. So this is what we use to support that urethra so that we can prevent that leakage that happens during exertion. The transvaginal mesh is quite different. It's not available in the market anymore, but you can see that it was a very large uh, piece of mesh and the design is completely different. This was a mesh that was placed through the vagina to hold up your organs, like when someone has a hernia or a drop bladder. You can see they're very, very different and they have different applications. Exactly. So that's why we believe it's, you know, very safe and effective to have the sling, but it's not for everybody. Most people who are planning to have a bigger family, for example, don't want to have this surgery because um, having another baby might render it ineffective or, or it could be sort of scary to have a baby after you've had a sling surgery. That's just one example. So the thing we're mainly here to talk about today is this next procedure called uh, periurethral bulking. Now I'm going to flip back again so you can see, because um, it happened in the in the cartoon right at the start. I'm going to go backwards and go forwards again. Watch this the little scope going into the urethra and injecting material in the wall of the urethra to kind of squish the urethra closed. This is an office procedure that we're doing um, every day. We're here in the office. We're doing some of this. It's very very common for us now, and it's not a brand new concept. Office um, bulking of uh, the urethra has been around a long time but the materials that we had to use were just not uh, very effective. So we were using it as kind of a salvage or a touch up sometime for if, if the slings um, didn't create perfection. But, uh, but now we've got a new material that, that behaves a lot differently than our, our older materials. Our older materials had the consistency of maybe like toothpaste or something like that. And they, they worked, but not very well. Now we've got a new, new material that we wanna talk about, which um, is called, um, called Bulkamid is a, a brand new system. I'm sorry. You want to... Yeah, go back on this slide for a second. So I sure. want to point out that what you see there, those white little nodules, think of it as a filler. So, you know, we see nowadays people get fillers in the face and the lips and it basically plump up the tissue. 
But what we're trying to do here is like, if you have a urethra that is wider or it has lost that sphincter mechanism by injecting a filler in the walls of the urethra, now the urethra is gonna be narrower. So it's gonna be easier for that urethra to hold on to that urine so it doesn't slip away. And when people are worried, uh, you know, nowadays you hear a lot of bad things about fillers for um, cosmetic procedures. This is totally different. The product itself is 97% water and the 3% is some chemical, I don't know how to pronounce it, but it's what makes it so viscous so that it will not slip away. And, you know, the difference is dramatic in like had said before with the other bulkings, they will not work as well and they will reabsorb quite fast within a year or so. We have more long lasting results. I'll let you get into the rest of that. Yeah, so this is just a, a, the system that, uh, that we use. Um, I wish I had uh, more of a um, perspective to show you. This is, uh, fits in the palm of my hand, basically. Um, and this is the actual procedure happening. So th that scope is looking in the urethra and this is the injection of the material. And the idea is to create, we, we call them cushions, um, several cushions to kind of squish the urethra closed. The very first step is to numb up the area with, with numbing medicine and um, so that you don't feel the actual injection. And the numbing medicine part is the worst part, but it doesn't last very long. It's, a, it's, it's the kind of thing where we don't um, need any sort of sedation. A person drives themselves here and they drive themselves home. And it's, um, most people tell us that it's, it's, it's not too bad. It's worth it, uh, definitely, to have the, the numbing medicine and then get this procedure. And it works immediately. Yeah, and the, the size of that needle, remember this is magnified. So that needle is very, very small. I would, um, in my experience, most patients will feel the numbing um, anesthetic, just like when you go to the dentist, you know, that first moment where they put the anesthesia is a little bit sore. And then after that, they don't feel anything. We're talking through the procedure. They're, you know, they're just very comfortable. It's done in the office in the same exam table that we would use to do a pelvic exam. It literally takes, just like you saw in the video, I mean, a few minutes and they walk out of here. And the importance is that there's no real downtime. They can go exercise the same day if they want. They could do whatever they actually want. The only thing that we tell them is not to insert anything in the vagina for the first few weeks because you don't want to squeeze or, or, or put too much pressure on that urethra. But other than that, you can go swimming, you can run, you know, you can do whatever you want. And like, you know, this is dramatic in comparison to having to go to a procedure and, you know, having those two weeks where you cannot lift or exercise or do certain things. Exactly. And the, the thing that I think is important is this procedure doesn't burn bridges. That's why it's so attractive for patients who, let's say they're not finished completing their family, but they're leaking a lot of urine and it might be several years before they have another baby. There's no reason that you need to um, live like that. You could have this. And then if one day you decided if it wasn't still working after, let's say you had another child, then you, you could come back and have the other procedure and there wouldn't be any, any reason you couldn't do that. Um, here's the results. We, now, the, the, I guess you think of this as the, as the negative. Um, it's a pretty new uh, product. So we've got um, uh, some good research, but it's uh, relatively small studies that are about one to two years out now. Um, and what, but it is a proper study. It's a randomized trial comparing the sling that I, I mentioned before versus this material called Bulkamid. So women were randomized to receive one or the other. And uh, depending on how you define cure, the cure rates for the, the sling uh, were in the 90s, 90% range, and the, and the cure rate for the Bulkamid was in, say, the uh, around 60, 60 plus percent range overall. And, um, and these are being pretty strict with the, with the um, definitions. So you can see that the, while the, the sling is, is superior, um, statistically superior, um, the, the mocha bed works pretty well, especially for a procedure where you're, you know, drive yourself in, drive yourself away, and it takes about 15 minutes. Um, the um, the follow-up, uh, go ahead. Sorry, I just got a quick, uh, good question there. Uh, someone asked if this procedure is covered. Yes, it is covered. It's not considered experimental. It's been around for a long time. And there's, we do get a prior authorization for every patient who's having a procedure done, but there's, there's no reason why the insurance will deny it. So you don't have to worry about being cosmetic or experiment or anything like that. That's right. And we should mention that when, when we're meeting you and, and we don't just listen to your talking about the, of the problem you have, 
we objectively test you to make sure that we've we've documented the exact type of um, leakage that you have and the and the amount your bladder can hold, and we get a good idea that this would be a good idea for you as a procedure to have, and um, and then that documentation and that testing that we do is what uh, makes the insurance companies um, uh, be willing to to pay for it. And at, after another thing to note is that some people will do what we call a touch up of the bulk amid after about three, three months or so in the study I just mentioned about 40% um, or so received a bit of a touch up because it wasn't completely effective. And um, at, at the end of um, one year, a couple of the uh, patients in the sling arm of that study had received the bulk amid and, um, and then so about 15% of the bulk amid group had gone on to receive the, the TBT. So, um, uh, or yeah, which is the sling I mentioned. So this is, this is the last slide of our, of our informational um, part of this. I just wanted to have you know that this research is ongoing, even though this is a relatively new material, I think it's perfectly safe. As Dr. Saez mentioned, it's 97.5% water, and then there's a polymer in there that keeps it from being, or to be viscous. Overall, I think we can summarize by saying that we always offer non-surgical options first. And when it comes to any kind of surgery or procedure, we're using minimally invasive evidence-based approaches. And, and, and we always offer the latest office-based procedures for treatment of urinary incontinence, especially such as the, the bulk of men. Okay, thank you so much. Um, if anyone has any more questions, you may wanna type them in right now. Okay, thank you, Dr. Culligan, Dr. Culligan and Dr. Saez. Uh, I would also, as I wait, I'd like to remind everyone at home to please take a few minutes to complete the survey using the SurveyMonkey link, which can be found towards the bottom of the email you received when, with the link to join this meeting. Uh, if you are interested in future Valley live events, please visit www.valleyhealth.com backslash events for upcoming programs. And remember, most of these recordings will be um, on our site, www.valleyhealth.com backslash tune into health, which is one word. Okay, I don't see any more questions. Thank you guys so much. I hope you have um, everyone has a great day. Thank you. Sorry, if you guys are looking at the chat box, I did uh, send uh, the link for that overactive bladder lifestyle modifications, which I find it extremely helpful. So if you go into the chat right now, um, uh, you can click on it and you can download a copy of this uh, book for free. So I would um, definitely, oh, I think we have one question coming in. Pat, you wanna answer that one? Oh, I let, me, let me click on there, let's see. Does Volcomed loss of effectiveness leave Kegel less effective? Um, I don't think they're really related. I think that if you get, um, your, your Kegel muscle is nice and strong, then, then the muscle tone will provide some degree of, of continence. And, and so um, I think maybe what you're asking is, is if the bulk of is less effective, can you make it more effective by uh, exercising your Kegel muscles? And you probably, yeah, you probably could um, because it's all uh, acting from different um, parameters on the same um, function. Um, we have a... Another question here, someone asking is, is the procedure performed by urologists and gynecologists? So I'm going to clarify that. So this procedure is performed by either urologists or urogynes. However, urologists could also have a subspecialty, just like we uh, have a subspecialty. I think um, the word urogynecologist is confusing, but basically um, you can dedicate yourself to urinary incontinence and prolapse, just like myself and Dr. Colligan. That's all we do all day, every day. We don't see any general gynecology. We don't deliver any babies. And our background is on obstetrics and gynecology. And then we did a whole fellowship training for this. A urologist who is not subspecialized would see patients for prostate for this, for that. Now, there are certain urologists who subspecialize, just like we did, in treating prolapse and incontinence. And I would say that you want to look for someone in your community who has what we call a female pelvic medicine and reconstructive surgery fellowship. And they're board certified in this subspecialty because that means that the bread and butter or their, of their day is seeing women who have this issue and they're not distracted by other conditions and they're truly 
specialist in the field. So you want to look for female pelvic medicine and reconstructive surgery board certified specialist, whether it is a urologist with a fellowship or an OBGYN that did a fellowship, which is the case of myself and Dr. Collier. And we've both been doing this for, I mean, way over a decade now that we self-specialize, even though we may look young, but we're not young. You look young. <laughs> um, there's someone saying, I do not see the link for overactive bladder. So if you scroll up on it, I'm going to um, send it again on the chat. There we go. So hopefully you can click on it right now. And then I think we have, let's see. Oh, we have another question now. I uh, say, how often is the Volcamid treatment needed? You want to answer that one, Pat? Sure. That, that varies from person to person. So um, that, that group of 60% of women that are, that are still dry at a year, they don't need another injection and they may never need another injection. Um, but then the other, let's say 40%, maybe they need another injection at some point. Um, now, we don't have long-term data to say that they'll never need one again after that, so we don't really know um, uh, perfectly, but it's safe to say that when you have a bulk emit injection, you should be thinking that there may be a, 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 um, a, some lack of effectiveness later that would um, prompt you to, to have a second injection. Yeah, and I mean, I tell my patients that this is meant to last four years. And even there's no great data out there, but there are some studies that look at, I believe it's seven years, right, Pat? Right. Yeah, which is very encouraging. Although again, we need more studies, but um, this product has been around in Europe for close to a decade now. So in the US, we don't have good quality long-term data because it was FDA approved last year. Uh, but I think that, you know, thinking this is going to last for years, it's a good, um, you know, estimate. And also there's no cap on how many times you can have this procedure. So it's because if you have it today and then years later, you need it again, we can do it again because it will reabsorb over time. So it doesn't prevent you from having the procedure done years later down the road. Or maybe some of you are thinking, well, if I do this and then I need a surgery, I'd rather do the surgery now when I'm younger, but that doesn't, it's not the case since this is gonna hopefully last for years, you can do it later on as many times as you need to. Okay, thank you again. I hope everyone has a, a great day and appreciate your time. Thank you. Bye-bye now. Thank you. Bye-bye.